The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the final technical session for this year of CSI Next, the virtual chapter of CSI. My name is Nina Gillio. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really thrilled to have a really exciting program that has been set up for us, and we'll be getting into that in just a moment. But a few little housekeeping items that I would like to point out to everyone is, as I mentioned, this is our last technical session of the year. Our next meeting will be back on our regular schedule of the second Tuesday of the month. So we will be meeting on June 14th at noon Eastern. And look forward to having you all join us again. For those of you that are interested in getting credit for today's program, it is, has been credited through AIA, and you do just need to stay online, take the short survey following the session, and you will be receiving your credits. We are looking uh, for this next year. We are missing a few board members and committee chairs, and so we hope some of you will be interested in getting involved in the chapter itself. It's a great way to, to meet other people virtually and have a lot of fun. For those of you that are interested, if you want to contact myself or any of the other board members, we would be happy to give you more information about that. CSI Construct is coming up in September, and registration opened, I believe, earlier this week, and we hope to see many of you there. So, again, if you have questions for this session, pretty much as we do on all of our webinars, if you will type your question into the question box, I will be working with coordinating with our presenter today to ask the questions and make sure to get those all answered. So please just type your questions whenever you think of them and really looking forward to this program. Rob Husarek is one of our, I'm hesitant to say old members, he's one of the long time long-standing charter members and was really responsible along with a few other key individuals for developing CSI Next. And so we are indebted to him not only for getting the chapter started, but also for presenting our presentation. I'll let him tell you a little bit more about himself, and we will go from there. So if you have any questions, again, type it into the uh, question box, and we'll go from there. So Rob, why don't I hand it off to you? Thank you, Nina. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking for, for all of you today. Uh, the program on Krakow, from castles to Ikeas. Um, I am a uh, licensed architect in the U.S. and uh, I'm not a historian. Uh, Krakow is a very, very historic a city with very rich history and culture. And I wanted to present this program not speaking as necessarily an expert in, in urban design or Krakow, but uh, just presenting it uh, just because the, the city to me is very interesting and I'm very fascinated in how people live and different ideas of urban design. And Krakow has this a uh, very interesting opportunity that uh, within one city you have many different ideas of urban design and there are pluses and minuses to, to all those ideas. Uh, so I want to share them with you today. A little bit about myself. Again, I am a licensed U.S. architect. I've been living in Poland for six years. Um, I came to Poland the first time uh, 15 years ago as an exchange student with the University of Tennessee School of Architecture. This is an exchange that has been going on for almost 25 years now, and it's a well-established program. While I was here, I met my wife, and uh, we fell in love and later got married, 
And uh, so we're living together in Tennessee, in Memphis, for about seven years, and she was working for International Paper, and they also have an office here in Krakow, so we, we got transferred and moved here with, with our son. Um, I first joined CSI in 1998, so next year will be my 20th anniversary. I'm a former president of, of both the Memphis and CSI Next chapters, um, and a former student member, because I, uh, I was a student member of the uh, Knoxville Student Affiliate when I joined as a freshman at the University of Tennessee. I'm currently working for CH2M. Uh, for those of you don't, who are not familiar with CH2M, it's uh, one of the top 10 largest engineering firms in the world. We have about 25,000 employees worldwide and uh, somewhere around 400 offices. Um, our office here in Krakow, we have almost 1,000 people here with many different disciplines. So I've been here in uh, Poland for, for quite a while. Uh, I'm a big fan of Krakow. I, I love living here. It has a great ambiance, and uh, the city is a very, it's a, it's a nice sized city. It's not too big. It's not too small. It uh, really has this nice human scale to it. Uh, so just a little bit uh, kind of overall look at Poland and Krakow. Uh, here is, we have a map of Poland here. Um, it, this is considered Central Europe. Uh, I know a lot of Americans, we typically think of Poland uh, as part of Eastern Europe with it being part of the, the former communist bloc countries. Um, but uh, just a, a word of caution, people get very sensitive here about when, when people call Poland Eastern uh, Europe. This is the geographic center of Europe. Um, it is about half the size of Texas. Uh, Poland was baptized in uh, 966, so it is uh, about over 1,020 years old. Um, it is the home of the Jagiellonian University, which is the second oldest university in the world. This was started in 1364, um, and that is where uh, Copernicus uh, went to university studies. In fact, you can go to the uh, the, uh, the old university buildings here, Collegium, Collegium Maium in Krakow, and uh, they have the astrolab that was used by Copernicus. Poland is the second nation in, in the world to have a constitution. Um, though for 120 years, Poland did not exist on a map. Uh, there was a period of time that uh, Poland was being occupied by Russia, Prussia, and the Austro-Hungarian empires. Uh, after World War II, Poland suffered through 50 years of communism. It had a huge economic effect on the country uh, that is still seen today. A little bit about Krakow. Krakow, the size of Krakow is a population of about 800,000 people. Um, when you look at the the metro area of Krakow, it's closer to almost double that. Um, it is a top 10 city for shared services. We have many major corporations all over the city, including IBM, uh, International Paper, Cisco, Motorola, CH2M, Shell, um, Rolls-Royce, and many others. Uh, Krakow has become quite a center for shared services because, well, for one, you have uh, very cheap labor here. Uh, typically, incomes are about a third of what you have in America. And you have a very 
highly educated population here. There are 24 institutions of higher education in Krakow alone. Uh, with schools like the Jagiellonian University, uh, Agiaha, and the uh, Polytechnic University of Krakow, uh, we have uh, people who are learning all the latest technologies, very high, highly qualified uh, uh, people, engineers, uh, IT, finance, those uh, tend to be the main uh, areas of study. Here is just a, uh, a present day kind of look at Krakow. Let me get my highlight here. Right here, this is what is the city center, the, the historic city center right here. Um, here you have the castle. This is the main market square, which is the largest market square in all of Europe. Uh, you have the Jewish district of Kazimierz in here. Um, across here, this is the area called Podgorza. And right, where is it? Right in this area here, we have uh, what is the or was the Schindler factory. So those of you who have seen Schindler's List, this is Oscar Schindler's factory right here. So those are some highlights of the city. Getting into the, the development of the city. The city uh, was developed uh, during medieval times. Uh, Krakow uh, was uh, made the, the capital of Poland in 1020 uh, by the first king. Um, and the first king, uh, he built uh, Babel Castle, which is right here, on the, above the Jurassic Cave. And um, the, there was a legend that, um, that there was a mythical king called King Krak, or Krakus. And there, in that cave, there was a dragon called uh, Smoke Wawelski. So here we have the, uh, the kind of legends and fairy tales that develop out of me medieval times. They, they actually come uh, they actually exist in the city right here. So the city was organized along a typical medieval grid of the time, and it, the entire city was fortified with a fortification wall going all around the city proper. Uh, there was, of course, the quintessential moat and a series of gatehouses. There's one, another one over here, another one over here, and over here. Um, the road coming up from here, this is, uh, you see early day Kazimierz, or the Jewish district over here. Uh, the road leading uh, to the south here was a major connection uh, to trade routes. And the route over here, this was the coordinate, coordination route for the king. So the king would be processing uh, through the gatehouse, down the street, uh, through the market square, down this is uh, Grodzka Street here, and then down here, this is the old, one of the oldest uh, streets architecturally uh, in the city. This is Kanonicha Street, which leads to Vavil Castle. Um, the city was, of course, the, the center for development of, of culture, of art, uh, the, the social traditions of Poland. A lot of them or, uh, originated here. 
The city was initially uh, made with wooden uh, structures, a lot of small wooden structures that would be uh, put into, into grids within the, the main streets. The market square would have had many wooden stalls for people to sell uh, various goods for trade. Um, and then when uh, it was King Kazimierz the Great uh, who inherited a, a country made of wood and he left it uh, made of stone. Over the years, the, the city suffered many fires and sieges from other countries. Um, so Kazimierz uh, invested a lot into the city and into the country to convert everything to stone, a much harder, more durable uh, building material, uh, definitely more permanent and resistant to fire. Um, and the nice thing about Krakow is that a lot of the city is still intact. Uh, this, this image that you see here, this is based on a, um, a computer-generated model, but this, this map that you see is hundreds of years old, and you can still point to a lot of these buildings here today. Um, this is the, the old city hall here. Most of the, the kind of surrounding buildings that you see um, here do not exist right now, but we still have the tower. We still have, this is the, the main um, market building uh, known as the Cloth Hall or Sukinitsa in Polish, uh, still there. Here we have uh, St. Mary's Basilica, beautiful, beautiful church. And uh, the, the medieval grid is all still intact. Now, the, um, the fortification walls, that only exists in pieces. We have this, uh, this is called the Barbican right here. This was the main gate. So this gatehouse is also here and fragments of the wall. But in the, uh, the 17th century, I believe, 17th, no, is uh, end of 18th century, sorry, uh, the uh, Hungarian Austro-Hungarian Empire controlled this area, and they said, ah, you're under our control, you don't need any walls anymore, you'll be perfectly fine being with us. Yeah, right. So, during the 18th century, they did take down most of the uh, fortification walls, and then I think not too much longer, you, you at least had uh, World War I. So. Uh, Krakow's history is, well, Poland's history in general is not very, uh, uh, very uplifting. This is a country, and you could say the same for the city, uh, that is constantly uh, has seen war and uh, battles and sieges from, from other lands. Uh, here you have, you know, Mongols, the Tatars, the Swedes, the Russians, uh, Germans all have been through Poland and conquered and fought and plundered. Uh, so really the history is quite tragic, unfortunately. Uh, luckily, I think one of the things that has uh, helped Krakow is that it is such a beautiful city and a lot of the people who have come in to uh, occupy this area want to keep Krakow for themselves. Um, this St. Mary's Basilica here, I think I have a, uh, here's another map. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a map from uh, 1785. You can s still see that the, uh, that the city pretty much looks as the same as the image that I showed you that I think is even uh, at least 200 years older. Uh, again, you have uh, Kazimierz, the Jewish district here, and the old city center. A lot of, uh, back in these times, a lot of there were areas that are now part of the city that back in these times, they were a completely different city of their own. Uh, Kazimierz was one of those areas. It was his own city until it was later incorporated 
Podgorza, which is down across the river over here, was another uh, village. You had other villages up here, which are now districts of the city. You have like Klepaj uh, uh, and um, Kloverdelska and a few others. So this is how it looks today. You can still see this area. It uh, represents uh, the, the oldest part of Krakow's history. Here we, we still see the St. Mary's Basilica and the Cloth Hall. You can see that uh, the, the organization of the city is very formal with the grid, and that generally the, the housing, the, the, the buildings are very, very dense. Um, everything within the city walls had to be self-sustaining. So everything everybody uh, needed within the city was available within those walls. Um, so you had schools, you had churches, you had trade, you had work, everything happening in the middle of the city. Here we have some of the Jagiellonian University buildings. Uh, we have public squares. Uh, this is the, the old theater house right here. Uh, this is actually the church where I got buried, which was built in the year 1300. Uh, this is one of the oldest churches in Krakow. Uh, this is St. Albert. And it's very interesting, uh, the, the planning uh, various axes that, that happen within the city, you can see how uh, everything is, is organized around the square, how the, the square really influences everything else. Um, you see that St. Mary's Basilica is kind of put in, on an angle. That was a strategic decision. As the uh, town progressed and prospered, uh, the basilica was uh, enlarged more and more, and we actually have uh, guard towers, is the uh, the taller tower here. I have another image of that. I'll get back to it. We'll come back to that. Uh, but here's a closer look at the block. And, you know, one of the the kind of uh, basic elements, when, when you're looking at, you know, modern urban design versus uh, traditional urban design, is how the space is formed. In traditional urban design, it's almost as if all of the spaces, all the buildings are kind of uh, carved out of the ground, um, whereas uh, more modern ideas uh, have the buildings are like freestanding objects rather than kind of rising up, being carved out of the, out of the landscape. Um, so really, really dense construction. You have these uh, instances here. These are courtyards. And multiple buildings may share a courtyard. Um, but one of the disadvantages here, we, we really have problems getting uh, natural light into here. This is uh, St. Mary's Basilica. This is on the square. So you can see uh, we have the taller tower here. This uh, was designed as a guard tower. Uh, there was a watchman, a night watchman up here. And in the case of invasion, they would typically sound a, a, an alarm with the bugle. Um, and it's tradition now you'll hear there, there is still the bugler at the top of this tower. It's typically a fireman who does it uh, every hour on the hour they will uh, play the bugle. And there is a, th uh, a legend that, uh, that there was an invasion by the Tatars. And while the bugler was sounding the alarm, he was hit in the throat by an uh, arrow. And so every time uh, they do this bugle uh, call at, uh, on the hour, there's a little kind of hint to that to that one watchman uh, in how they play the bugle that kind of just abruptly stops. 
Um, here you can see some of the architecture of the, the buildings surrounding the square. Uh, here we have uh, many different palaces um, nowadays being reused for, for uh, modern shops and there are residences and offices. These buildings see a lot of use. Uh, here we have a Hard Rock Cafe. Um, and another thing that is very characteristic that you'll see throughout the, the old part of the city is this kind of combination between brick and stone, as you see up here in the top of the tower. Uh, why is that? Well, brick was cheap. Krakow was never a really, uh, not a very wealthy city. Uh, so typically they, they used brick because it was, it was easy to get, it was cheap. Uh, the stone uh, was used to, for, for more strength. It's, it's harder, it's more durable, it can take more load. So you would also often see uh, brick infill that could be exposed brick, it could be uh, stuccoed over, and then you would see an exposed uh, stone often at the corners. It makes for a very nice effect, though, nowadays. Rob? Yes? What type of stone is it, and where does it come from? Uh, it's all local. Uh, one type of stone you would see is uh, sandstone, uh, which is problematic because it does, it does uh, uh, erode very easily. Uh, and, and that's evident in a lot of the buildings. There's also another uh, stone uh, that is a very, very white stone, but I do not know what it translates to in English. Great, thank you. This uh, square, uh, if, if you ever visit Krakow, uh, this square was ren re renovated, uh, it was finished about eight years ago. Uh, starting in uh, 2004, I believe, they wanted to repave the entire square. Uh, but as they were uh, wanting to change the pavers, they also wanted to see what was underneath the pavers. So they were doing archaeological digs all around the square. And instead of filling it back in, they actually made a museum underground, under this uh, this square. So um, it's very, very interesting. Uh, you get to see the, the old foundations of buildings, sometimes even old walls of buildings that were, uh, at one point they were above ground. Um, and, and get an idea, it, it shows a lot about the life and how people lived uh, back in medieval times within Krakow. Uh, very fascinating museum. So this is a shot of uh, Vavil Castle. Here you can see again uh, what I was talking about, combination of stone and brick. This is uh, Kanonicha Street, uh, so-called for the, uh, the, uh, the canons who lived at the end of the street, the, the uh, religious uh, leaders because in the Vavil Hill, which is what we use to refer to the complex where, where Vavil Castle sits, uh, right on that hill you also have the uh, Krakow Cathedral uh, mixed there uh, with the castle. So a lot of the clergy would live down at the end of this street over here um, to serve the church. Uh, this is one of the buildings that I actually studied in this is, belongs to uh, Politecnica Krakowska, or the Krakow Technical University. So um, when the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, when they took down the fortification walls, uh, they also filled in the moat that surrounded the city and made a big park, this park goes around the city, it's called the Plante. But when we cross there, we, it's, we kind of are crossing into a, another area of development, uh, mainly caused by uh, 
uh, economic growth in the city and uh, prosperity. So uh, from, from this inner ring, ring out to the next outer ring uh, that uh, circumferences the city, we typically see around the end of the 19th century uh, to very beginning of the 20th century uh, some growth. There are some, some areas that are much older that kind of dot this area. Uh, for instance, this area in here, uh, there are some much older buildings. Um, this is uh, my parish church right here. Uh, and uh, that's been around for many hundreds of years. I think it was built in the uh, 1600s. And um, then this is my neighborhood up here. Uh, this is where I live. My uh, my building was was built in 1905. Um, but again, the urban design it's a little bit more, a little bit less dense, uh, much bigger uh, courtyards, green space within the the city blocks. Uh, but I think one of the most important things that you see about Krakow is that the scale of the city, the scale of the buildings that you see in historic Krakow are very uh, short. Uh, only uh, maybe five, maybe up to eight stories in some cases, but very rarely, but generally around five, six stories you will see. And so you, you have a space that is um, very comfortable for people. It's very pedestrian oriented, uh, not so much on cars. The streets tend to be very narrow. Uh, not much room for parking at all, as you'll see in, in future slides. Um, but it does very much concentrate on the pedestrian and the, the kind of connection that you have, kind of this very uh, personal connection with the city, just from, from the, the scale of the city. So this is the kind of situation you see. The the kind of buildings that we have in Krakow, I guess the the closest that you could come to in America would be the tenant house. Um, what we typically have here is five to six stories, and on each story you may have, uh, traditionally it would be probably two apartments per story. Uh, there would be a central entryway with a central staircase and each landing at the staircase would have uh, two doors, one to each apartment. Um, again, it's keeping the traditional space, still kind of carving out of the landscape, the roads and the, the space def defined by the buildings. Uh, throughout here, you still keep up with uh, having all the, the things that are necessity to uh, necessary to living, uh, public spaces like churches and schools and parks, uh, all integrated within the, the, the city fabric. Uh, typically, in each building, you would uh, have, maybe not every building, but most buildings you will have on the ground floor uh, sort of a business retail space uh, with people living in the upper floors. We have an another question, I'm sorry, before you go on. No. Um, one of them, um, it's been asked as to how are those green spaces the, the maintained? Does that become the residents in that neighborhood, are they responsible for it, or who kind of maintains it and grooms and and takes care of it? Well, if it's if it's a private space, if it's a private courtyard, which a lot of what you see within these these buildings, uh, then that is maintained by the the uh, building owners. Like this building here, this the land is probably something like that. So each owner within that, that building, each owner has a certain percentage 
of the common property that is owned by them. So that includes the roof, that includes the, the walls, um, that includes uh, the land. They will own a certain percentage based, up, based upon the amount of area that they own. Uh, and so they have to uh, maintain all of those things. There, there's typically a, a residence association fee that, that is paid to maintain those. Uh, windows are not considered common property. Windows are considered property of the, uh, the apartment to which they open to. Um, and then the same thing goes through if that land uh, also is uh, associated to that building and it's on the front of the building, then the property owners need to maintain that as well. That in includes sidewalks. Uh, there are city ordinances that they must maintain the sidewalks, that they must keep them clean and sweep them re regularly, that they must remove the snow during, during the winter time. Uh, snow must be removed from the sidewalks, but also must be re removed from the, the roofs as well. Um, parks are all maintained by the city um, and, and that they do. Uh, though there, there are quite a few parks, so I'm, I'm sure that's quite a lot to maintain. So this is uh, a drawing. This is kind of your, what you would see in the basic cityscape, the basic street. Uh, we have lots of trams throughout Krakow, uh, which is nice. You, you get to see where you're going, see your surroundings. Uh, this is my street. Uh, not all of the buildings look wonderful right now. Uh, there are a lot of buildings that still need to be renovated, but it's amazing to see how much renovation is taking place. Uh, some of these buildings could really look terrible, like they're really falling apart, there's stucco falling off, there's bricks falling off but uh, then somebody will come in and they will invest or the, the owners will finally get the money together to that they can renovate and it's just amazing the details. Um, we do have uh, you know, retail here. This is our, our corner store and uh, it's a really great store. You walk in there and the owner, he knows all of his customers you get some guy who's in a hurry. He's like, uh, Mr. Paul, I'm going to take this and I'll pay you later, okay? And he's like, oh, okay, no problem. Uh, my son, he has severe allergies. Whenever he walks in there, uh, they remember that he has uh, severe allergies and he can't eat certain kinds of foods. So they're also watching out for him and always asking about him. It's just, uh, it's just amazing. We don't have problems in the wintertime with uh, the stores being overrun. Uh, with people buying uh, milk, uh, eggs, and bread, because if it if we get a hard snow, then we just walk to the to the nearest corner store, and everybody's still there. They don't get blocked by their car because they walk to work. So, <clears throat> moving a little bit further in time. This road, what you see here, is, uh, is a main boulevard that uh, circumvents the city. Uh, this was uh, built in the early 1900s. Um, it is a, a main, very, very much a, a main route through the city. Uh, pretty much all traffic that is running directly north and south through the city runs through this, so we have a lot of traffic problems. Uh, with that. Um, but crossing over that major, what was uh, at that time a kind of major border in development, uh, we get into the early uh, 1900s, like the 19 teens and 20s um, and 30s. We're still keeping with uh, generally the, the same kind of, uh, of uh, um, urban design slight changes. Buildings are starting to get a little bit bigger, uh, more and more green space between the buildings, um, but still all of the basic necessities are there. 
this is what we're looking at uh, when we're talking about this era. Um, most of these buildings here were built in the 1920s. So much, much higher, much bigger, uh, but uh, still uh, conducive to, to life in the city, uh, providing all the, the necessary support to the people who live there. Uh, during World War II, the Nazis invaded Krakow. Um, and when they invaded Krakow, they didn't want to destroy the city. Um, it was very much a, a, an advantage uh, to Krakow that in the 16th century, uh, King Sigmund uh, moved the nation's capital from Krakow to Warsaw. Uh, I, I strongly suspect that if, if Krakow existed as the nation's capital during World War II, then it probably would have been bombed to the ground like Warsaw was. Uh, but when the Nazis invaded Krakow, they actually wanted to keep it for themselves. Uh, so they started moving in and they wanted to grow roots. They, in the city, they, they uh, created master plans for the city. I tried to find some, some of the drawings, but I couldn't find them online. Um, but they also uh, were growing the city's uh, borders. They incorporated other uh, smaller villages that were outlying of the city, uh, brought them into the city. They uh, increased infrastructure and they also brought in their own kind of language in the design of housing. Uh, so what we see here, especially these red roof areas, the, these were projects that were uh, completed by the Germans. Now, what you see uh, very different here is you see much longer buildings. They have periodic staircases that allow the, the tenants to get up to their, to their flat. But they also uh, left a whole lot more green space. And a lot of times these spaces that you see in here, they were the areas for the public. So you would see parks, playgrounds in here. Uh, these these uh, buildings were actually built with shelters because of the war. They built underground shelters in these areas. So they have a very distinct look uh, here in Krakow. So this is what that, that space would look like. You still see that the, the buildings are still rather short. Um, here is the, the kind of centralized uh, staircase that would happen periodically down the building. And public space in between. After the war, uh, the uh, Soviet Union uh, took control over Poland and brought uh, communism into Poland. Uh, the communists uh, they had a major problem on their hand on their hands uh, of a housing crisis. After the war, many people lost their homes. They did not have a place to live. They were displaced. So housing was a big priority. Uh, one of the things uh, that came out of communism, uh, in early communism in the 50s, was the idea of social realism. Uh, this was an architectural style that, that borrowed various aspects of classical styles and uh, kind of combined them together. Um, they used very, very rigid uh, kind of forms of patterning. Um, and I think that the, the planning was very, very intricate and very detailed and, and actually very well thought out, especially uh, during this time, during, during the 50s, the quality of the, of the architecture, the, the planning, the thought that went into the buildings was was very high. 
what they didn't have a whole lot of was money and uh, resources. So um, although the ideas are, uh, were, were there, you can see, you know, you can see areas that maybe if these developments were made with the same ideas, but the, the resources that are available in Poland today, the, the, uh, the money, the materials, the ideas could have been probably even more fantastic. Um, so, me, so this is this is Nova Huta. This is what we just saw on the map. This area, Nova Huta, means new work. Uh, so this, at the time, was almost like uh, almost like a satellite city uh, from Krakow, uh, and it was built because the communist authorities were building large industry, uh, huge steelworks, not far from from this area. So this is uh, the the central square or Platz Centralne. Um, you can see the kind of classic uh, styling in, in these buildings. One of the big disadvantages I could see of the, the social realism was the, the kind of monotony of it. Uh, when, you, when you go into this, this area that has everything really looks so much the same. The other problem is, is that, well, since there was such a crunch for housing and there were so few resources available, you know, people had to live in very, very small spaces. Uh, average apartment uh, during the communist times was about 40 square meters, um, probably, probably around three, 300 square feet, three or 400 square feet, um, and that was for an entire family. It didn't matter if you had three people in your family or six people in your family. You had 40 square meters. Um, so this is this is Nova Huta today. Um, needs renovation, of course, but you can still see even if it was renovated, there is a lot of repetition. Uh, the 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 roads are very very wide during the communist times. Uh, there was always a kind of thought for an opportunity for for the parading of, of the communist propaganda throughout the streets, um, it starts to, to lose that kind of human connection to the city when you get out here. So as uh, communism continues throughout Poland uh, during even during the 70s and, and 80s, uh, they start to uh, have even more of an extreme uh, shortage of housing. And they need to start looking at uh, how to start producing more and more housing and quicker. Uh, the communists looked uh, to the 1920s modernism that happened throughout Europe, the ideas of uh, Le Corbusier uh, kind of uh, building as a machine for living, and the ideas of uh, prefabrication and modernization. And so you have these areas, these are probably, these kind of buildings they refer to today as blocks or blocky, uh, just because they're that, they're, they're blocks. They're so, uh, so block-oriented very straight forms, uh, very easy to put together with, in, uh, with prefabricated materials. Um, but you still see throughout this is that during the communist era that there was still a necessity to provide everything for life within, uh, within walking distance, within the neighborhood. So you still see, you know, shops on the first floor. Um, you still see, you know, schools, uh, everything within walking distance work. They did put, um, they had separate block buildings that they that they created for uh, for offices. They also would often have, if you had many uh, blocks of flats 
within an area. Sometimes there would be like a centralized uh, building for, for shops uh, where you could uh, possibly wait in line for uh, getting your ration of goods. Now, uh, as time went on, uh, the, like I said, the need for housing grew and grew. So these blocks got uh, even bigger. They would go up to like uh, 14 stories, sometimes even higher, and got very dense. The architects during this time, they did not have a whole lot of flexibility in designing the, the blocks themselves. They were given a kit of parts to work with. Uh, so a lot of them would get more creative, more intricate uh, with the space that is designed around those blocks or how the blocks were being arranged. So even though you had uh, very basic materials to work with, uh, the professionals would seek opportunities to bring architecture to this all. And you can see this is this is where the scale just gets totally out of that kind of intimate personal scale of the city. These blocks are are very uh, brutal. They're very um, uh, very heavy and uh, take the personality out of the city. Uh, there's there's a lot of theory that the the communists wanted to use this architecture to help control the people, uh, that uh, the modernist uh, ideas, these very simple forms, very clean forms without any, any kind of aesthetics to it, uh, would prevent the kind of uh, free thinking um, that the, the authorities would often try to group uh, people of similar profession uh, within one block community so that people wouldn't have any true friendships. They would have people who were just uh, relations through work. So that had a very, uh, very severe impact on the community. And because, because it, everything was provided to these people, you often didn't see, even today, you don't see a whole lot of investment into these buildings to maintain them, to keep them up. So that, that is all, always a challenge. Um, even today, there's, there's even some of these buildings that they actually have a shelf life because the materials were, were so, uh, they were so low quality materials back in that time. Uh, there is fear that a lot of these buildings are not structurally sufficient because of the degradation of the, of the concrete and the reinforcement of the concrete over time. So some of these buildings only have a shelf life of uh, another 30 years or so. So now we come to modern times. Uh, this is probably, uh, in a lot of respects, one of the most challenging uh, stages of urban design for the city. Um, now, with, uh, with the free Poland, uh, without uh, communism, there is capitalism, and we have a whole bunch of investors coming into Krakow from all over the world to develop uh, very cheap property into very expensive property, uh, mostly by, by quick money. And over the years, uh, since 1989, when when uh, when Poland, uh, when the communist communism fell in Poland, we see more and more sprawl throughout our cities. So uh, during the area of of pre-war Krakow, what we would have seen in the city, and I, I kind of define that as probably the the golden years of, of urban design. For, for Krakow and for most cities, but that area would have been pretty much this area in here. And now you can see this is the entire metropolitan area of Krakow. 
and all this down here is housing and uh, big box stores and there is more and more a, uh, an emphasis on cars and people having to use those cars to do things. The development is not growing very well with the infrastructure to support it. Uh, communities are now being designed almost like what you had in communism, but in some respects worse, because now not only do you have uh, big blockies, big blocks of, of apartment buildings, but they're forgetting the ideas of providing this, the necessities for the inhabitants of the city. No longer, uh, not always providing retail space on the, on the first floor, not, uh, not providing uh, places for worship, for school, for work, close by. Everything is very kind of segre segregated into either residential or commercial. Whereas if you remember from what we discussed early on, everything was being uh, mixed within. So this is, you know, where I come to the, the title uh, of, of my presentation, uh, Crackle from Ca Castles to Ikeas. Um, you know, we have this incredible medieval uh, city plan uh, that has held so nicely throughout the years, and now the city is uh, ever more sprawling to make way for uh, these Ikeas and other big box stores like uh, here we have grocery stores that will easily rival uh, uh, places like Walmart, uh, Carrefour and Real and Jean and, and uh, all these other foreign companies. This is a big uh, shopping mall right here, one of many that we have throughout the city. Uh, we have residential areas here, but uh, these big residential areas, that's all they have is, is housing. Here we have uh, more development. This is, uh, this is to the south of the city in an area called Cervoni Maki. We have uh, uh, almost like an office park here. These are all uh, corporate office buildings. And then we have huge residential areas. Um, and if you look, again, you know, where, where, is the, where is the connection of the human scale? Uh, we have to put in these uh, sound barriers because of EU regulations that have, say if you have such a size road that has such a speed limit, then you have to provide uh, the barriers to the road uh, to protect people from sound and for, from pollution. Um, but we kind of, we've also lost this kind of uh, roadscape of, of having a, uh, a building with, uh, with retail on the first floor, some, some nice trees, lights that, uh, that light up sidewalks and, and not, you know, major thoroughfares. Uh, here is an image. This uh, I couldn't find the uh, an image of the uh, the actual development, but this has actually been built. This is a brand new development, and you can see that this is not too far off from what the communists were were building in the uh, in the eighties. Humongous developments, very small spaces, very cheap. It's quick money. We do have some very nice developments happening, uh, but they typically happen uh, more inside the, the downtown area of Krakow. These are areas where, where developers have to develop in a certain way because they're in a historic area. And so they have you know, height restrictions and uh, planning restri restrictions. The areas outside of the city center, typically the city does not have any plan for yet. And because we don't have a master plan, we don't have anything that is there to help control how the city grows. And we don't have any way to ensure that the, gro that the city grows in a smart way. Uh, so this is, um, this is a project that I actually uh, uh, worked on when, when I first moved to Krakow. 
I was working for a local uh, local architect. Um, so this w was the site of a historic brewery. Um, and this is called uh, Grover Lubich or uh, the Lubich Brewery. So here you have a uh, mix of old buildings and new buildings of uh, uh, different type of occupancies. We have retail space here, there's office space, there's residential space, all within one complex. So this is about the size of a city block. Um, this building right here, this is a historic building. This was the uh, Brew Master's Palace. Uh, and I don't know about you guys, but I have a respect for any country that, that puts the brewmaster in the palace. Shows you where the priorities are. So, um, and then we have uh, other buildings that uh, supported the brewery. Uh, this building here I know was a hops drying uh, uh, place. Um, so the, the new buildings, uh, they uh, you can see that they have this nice uh, scale that is consistent with the, the rest of the city. Um, uh, they have uh, some nice public areas and people generally feel well connected within this community. Here is another development that was uh, happening uh, downtown. Again, keeping uh, uh, the proper scale of the building um, and providing retail at the bottom to support people living in the downtown area. So, run right on time. Thank you all. Jin uh, Are there any other questions? Well, I want to know how to become a brewmaster so that I can live in a palace. But other than that, <laughs> no, that was outstanding, really very informative. And it's it's kind of sad in, in so many ways, and as you've kind of expressed, to see how the, the, the walkability of the, of the city has changed over the years. And yes, it doesn't really seem like um, in the last several decades now that you've really come anywhere from from the architectural standpoint, if they're just, you know, kind of throwing money at it and you're, you, the architecture has really, really gone so far awry from what was being done in, you know, pre, or early, early Middle Ages and, and early modern time, it just, you look at it and it's, it's just amazing. And for somebody like myself, I've never had the pleasure of traveling to these places. It's nice to be able to see and appreciate how smart the architects and the builders were early on and how much better they they maintained things so again rob thank you it was really really a pleasure i'm looking to see if we have any other questions it doesn't look like we did but i'm pretty certain that the rest of the group really really appreciated it as much as i did the the knowledgeable presentation and just kind of walking through history. Oh, I do. Oh, <laughs> one of our our attendees indicated that they we we'd like another two hours of of this for the presentation <laughs> because that would just I think that that really it develops the dialogue. So again, thank you very much. To our attendees, please make sure to stay on and take the survey. And Rob, um, I'm pretty sure it's time for you to go home and have dinner. So greet your wife and, and son for us. And thank you again. We look forward to having you join us in the future. It was my pleasure. <laughs>